going to base my presentation on three main points. The first is to briefly touch the drivers of why violent extremism is actually an issue online. Not the technological ones, but the underlying reasons why this has become a phenomenon that we are now sitting and discussing at the United Nations. Secondly, I want to share with you a little bit of evidence. Evidence on the base of how are actual materials that are used by terrorist groups on the internet actually being used. Not the quantity of materials that are being put out, but how they're being interacted with by potentially vulnerable populations that may, as Chris Painter has said, uh, go from the, uh, from the gap of radicalization to violence. And lastly, I'll share with you a few conclusions and recommendations that have come out of both our work, but also the work of the uh, special group that is being chaired by ICT for Peace Foundation, uh, with the inclusion of uh, private sector actors that has worked on this problem for the last six months. So first of all, it's very important to recognize that apart from the technological changes that we are used to discussing when we talk about the drivers of cybercrime, etc., the reality is that the movement into cyberspace has happened in a single generation. Never in the humani history of humanity have we had a technology that in a single generation has taken people's ability to act from the very local five or twenty kilometers in which they were born, the two hundred family members that they had known, or the thousand people that, de uh, that uh, defined their communities, to suddenly be able to engage in a friction-free manner with the totality of the global economy. This giant leap into cyberspace has moved far faster than institutions at all level, local, regional, or international, have been able to adjust, and has left us with a vast gap between where policy exists and where it should be in dealing with its consequences. Behind this giant leap into cyberspace are really the underlying demographics. Some of these demographics are quite well known. About half of the world's population is connected to broadband internet. There are more cell phones on this planet there than there are individuals. And in the next three years, pretty well all of those cell phones will become smartphones, which means phones that are capable of producing, sharing, and reproducing vast amounts of information. But here are the interesting underlying demographic facts. Two-thirds of those that are currently connected to the Internet are under the age of 35. Fifty percent are under the age of 25. What does that represent? This represents young adults just entering into their most productive years of life. This represents the demographic which is most motivated to challenge and change the status quo. This is the demographic that wants change in their economic, social, and political end of life. Where is that demographic coming from, this Generation D? Well, take a look into the face of the new digital natives. They're not coming necessarily from the high population countries, North America, Europe, India, or even China. In fact, statistically, three out of five new internet users are coming from countries or regions that are either considered to be fragile or under severe governance stress. What that means is that not only is the internet populated by young people who want change in their lives, they're also coming from areas where the structural elements of society, be they political, social, or economic, push them to challenge that authority even more. What that's meant is that we're increasingly living in an era where you have globalized cyber opportunity. You have a demographic that has been enabled by technology to be able to challenge that status quo, and we are seeing the impact of that through challenges to political authority, challenges to social authority, and challenges to economic authority. That's manifested itself into cybercrime. In Canada a few years ago, we did a study uh, jointly with Bell Canada to see just how many of the computer systems that we rely on are under the control of malicious software. And at that time, it was between five, or tw five to 12 of all connected devices were effectively under the control of some kind of malware. That statistic is probably far higher today because of, as we've heard earlier, the issue of the Internet of Things. And interestingly enough, it's not the major developed economies that are most affected by cybercrime. In fact, if you look at the three uh, countries listed here, Russia, China, South Africa, look at the demographic of millennials, 75 percent, look at the gender imbalance, you'll see that this is an issue that uh, affects countries where those structural imbalances tend to be the highest. So let me share with you a little bit of evidence that came out of an initial 
uh, study done of monitoring violent extremist con uh, content in the country of Bangladesh. This is one of the first UNDP run surveys that is meant to underpin a new generation of programs designed to uh, address the prevention of violent extremism. The mission for this particular exercise was to map, assess and contextualize the scope and influence of violent ex online extremist communities and narratives in Bangladesh as a means of then being able to um, uh, create an appropriate programmatic response. Here are some of the key findings. First of all, Bangladesh is a highly connected country. It has gone from one of the least connected country with less than 6% of the population connected to, 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 to basic telephony to now 87% of the population having access to a mobile phone. 33% are connected to internet and about 13% of those are connected to Facebook. Now that statistic again is li likely to change in the next two years because that generation of cell phones to which people are connected are starting to become smartphones very quickly so you can see the internet statistics rising to about 87% in the next year. Now, Generation D, this digital generation which are the prime consumers of this connected environment, also face significant challenges, developmental challenges, which include governance system which is fragile, economic opportunities which are limited, and also inequality which drives social pressures for change. And those changes, those pressures in those areas are increasingly being seen online, including in violent extremist content. So what do we know about violent extremist content? And I'll say here that we looked at 11 months worth of data that pulled the totality of social media traffic that was accessible in the public domain in order to generate these findings. Well, first of all, what we found is that about 60% of the interaction with these, this violent extremist content, that means people act either liking it, sharing it, posting it, or reposting it, were located inside of Bangladesh. That's to be expected. But 30% were actually outside of Bangladesh. It was, in fact, the migrant population of workers that was seen to be statistically more engaged in dealing with violent extremist content, specifically uh, put on the internet by violent extremist groups, than were Bangladeshis, inside of Bangladesh. But here's the real surprise, or maybe not such a big surprise. The actual interaction rate, rate with this content was very, very low. So of the total population of Bangladeshis online over a period of 11 months, only 0.23% actually looked at violent extremist content, or rather interacted with violent extremist content. So the quantity of content was quite considerable, but the actual interaction with it was very, very low. The higher levels of interaction were actually among younger Bangladeshi males seeking economic opportunity abroad, who seemed to be the most vulnerable to this content. And just as an aside, we did a similar, uh, or we had a similar discussion with our colleagues from the Russian Federation, which looked at uh, guest workers coming from Central Asia and Russia, which also identified this particular group as being the most vulnerable to uh, violent extremist content. Interestingly enough, that when we looked at interaction with content as a whole, what we found was not so much violent extremist contest created by terrorist organizations as having the greatest impact. In fact, the greatest impact that we saw in the radicalization to violence uh, spectrum that Chris talked about was the impact of fake news that was used to incite interconventional tensions and which had a significant impact during the October 2016 violence. What that means is news sites or sites that were set up unattributed and unconnected to any kind of group but which literally existed in order to create disinformation around a particular topic. When we mapped this, for example, uh, against the events in October, we could clearly see a correlation, and I'm going to slip back and forth, between those sites which were, and we call them mob violence, unattributed uh, fake news sites, and the instances of violent occurrences in physical space. Um, Facebook and Twitter played a material role here. Uh, they were the dominant uh, social media that was used by violent extremist actors, although the levels of sophistication used in Bangladesh were far lower than those that we've seen in the Middle East. Twitter, which incidentally only has about 1% penetration inside of Bangladesh, was principally used as a broadcast network to promote access to either Facebook pages, WordPress blogs, or links to audio and written material and video on the Internet. Um, 
this is the structure of what Twitter, uh, the, the terrorist networks in uh, Twitter looked like. As you can see, these are unidirectional broadcast networks rather than communities of individuals interacting with each other. Facebook, which has a much higher penetration, it's actually now higher than 13%. This is where there were in-depth interactive sharing among users who constructed a community and would share amongst themselves and repost, uh, uh, repost content that defined that particular community itself. In terms of the narratives, what was actually being shared, what was being put out, well, that fell into three categories. First of all, a religious justification for jihad. Secondly, discrimination against non-believers. Thirdly, Indian-Pakistan relations. Interestingly enough, very little of the content was linked to local issues. These were meta-narratives that effectively define these movements rather than things that were specifically tied to local events that could be used to uh, motivate individuals. So let me conclude with three concluding thoughts. First of all, on the basis of our study, I could say that the private sector really is a key partner to being able to deal with the problem of violent extremist content online. Why is that? Well, as it's already been said by numerous speakers over the last two days, it's because that's where the data resides. And private sector companies, because of their global nature, are really the only ones that, through data, can address the issue of the content itself. And they're actually uniquely uh, capable of so doing. Things like automated counter-messaging, using Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Google advertising may actually be the best means of being able to rapidly respond um, to both the issue of fake news as well as reaching at-risk groups which may be outside of the borders of a particular ju a jurisdiction, such as is the case of Bangladeshis in the Gulf. It also requires tying in with local engagement with journalists, grassroots organizations. So there's a virtuous circle between a pub, a private uh, sector's ability to act technically and local actors' ability to be able to provide content. Secondly, it's clear that monitoring this space for impact is incredibly important because it, it lets you understand or lets us understand in more precise detail the risk factors that lead people to go from radicalization to violence and also to be able to identify who are the at-risk populations. Secondly, monitoring is important to develop early interventions and mechanisms for addressing risk, ones which are appropriate both to the scale, size and nature of the constituency that's at risk. And thirdly, it's important, monitoring is important um, to be able to measure the effectiveness of responses. We really don't know whether counter-messaging works unless we actually have a mechanism for being able to gauge its impact and then to use it to plan further activities. But monitoring is not easy, primarily because of the fact that the way that companies that have grown in the social media space they effectively are meant to profile their users. They're meant to profile their users because the principal product is effectively advertising, an ability to understand an audience to which you want to be able to sell something. Being able to use the same kind of technologies in order to monitor for at-risk communities creates a huge liability in terms of both privacy and potentially having these technologies used contrary to the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. The good news is that we have models to get around that. And I would push your attention to the public health monitoring efforts that were undertaken by the World Health Organization in the 1990s when a decision was made to treat violence prevention the same way as we previously looked at the spread of disease. That that model, which looks at surveillance from an anonymized data pool point of view, is equally applicable to being able to monitor for at-risk populations using risk factors. The challenge with it is that we actually need a global public-private partnership to make that happen. And this is my third point. This is for the following reasons. This chart shows you the relationship between users, the content they look at, and the data that's created that underpins pretty well every single IT company that provides either social media or other kinds of services. The user and user data is the key link between the content being interacted with and the underlying metadata that describes groups of users by their gender, their location, their preferences, their likes. In order to be able to use data coming from social media companies in a way that would not contravene human rights, 
effectively we have to ask them to take the user data out. We effectively want to create a link between the content being accessed, which is the risk factor, and the metadata of the community that may be at risk, as described by gender, location, preferences, and groups. Effectively, we want to take the middle out. We want to create data that doesn't have that private information within it. <laughs> what that calls for, and this is maybe my appeal, is perhaps considering, through a public-private partnership, defining an open data standard for community security a unique form of data or unique data stream that could be provided by industry to um, governments and community groups that is deliberately anonymized and privacy protected, just like medical and hospital records are. That this level of data, because it didn't contain the privacy information that, was pos that would, could be used for targeting individuals and groups at an individual level, could be made accessible for community use. For industry, it means a new model for corporate social responsibility and the creation of a new global public good that would benefit and enable uh, using monitoring for radicalization consistent with United Nations principles. This open data standard would establish a means to monitor cyberspace in the way that my uh, colleagues at Interpol and, uh, and Europol have described, but making it firmly consistent with guiding UN principles. I would also say, like with all other open data initiatives, it would also potentially launch an explosion of innovation at the global, regional, and national levels because all of a sudden there is now data that can be used for these purposes that doesn't incur the liabilities that have really uh, made it difficult to employ in the past. And that, at its essence, is really what the prevention of violent extremism is about. Um, finally, I think it's really important for all of us to keep talking about this topic. I've been very privileged in the last six months to be part of a unique group that was led by the ICT for Peace Foundation, sponsored by UNCTED, and had the participation of very strong uh, co co commercial partners. I'd single out Microsoft here in terms of their ability to sort of herd the cats, um, but that's not to say that any of the other partners contributed any less. I think in the last five months, we've made more progress than the last six years in terms of actually coming up with practical solutions to being able to deal with this problem. And on that, спасибо за внимание.